operate these places and our relationship with ASEAN and our commitment to ASEAN centrality. ASEAN is the heart of my administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, and we continue to strengthen our commitment to work in lockstep with an empowered, unified ASEAN. Today, we take another critical step, beginning a new era in our work in lockstep with an empowered, unified ASEAN. Today, we take another critical step, beginning a new era in our cooperation with the long step with an empowered, unified ASEAN. Today, we take another critical step, beginning a new era in our cooperation with the launch of the U.S. ASEAN Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Together, we will tackle the biggest issues of our time, from climate to health security, defend against the significant threats of rule-based order, to rule-based order, and, the, and to threats to the rule of law, and to build an Indo-Pacific that's free and open, stable and prosperous region. Together, we will tackle the biggest issues of our time, from climate to health security, defend against the significant threats of rule-based order, to rule-based order, and, the, and to threats to the rule of law, and to build an Indo-Pacific that's free and open, stable and prosperous, resilient and secure. And we're putting real resources behind our approach, not just rhetoric. Over the last year, my administration has announced based order, to rule-based order, and the as the we gather with all all of you again this is my third u.s asean summit in my presidency and i was honored to host the white at the white house in may and now uh, that we are back together here in cambodia i look forward to building uh, even stronger progress than we've already made and i want to thank the prime minister of for colombia's leadership and the asean as asean chair and for hosting all of us. And, and also, I want to recognize that, that we're going to be in, uh, in the, all the work that Indonesia has done this year, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Um, and as the, uh, uh, the country coordinator, uh, coordinator for the United States. And uh, in fact, uh, this is, uh, as I said, my third trip, uh, my, uh, my third summit, second in person. And it's testament to the importance the United States places in our relationship with ASEAN and our commitment to ASEAN centrality. ASEAN is the heart of my administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, and we continue to strengthen our commitment to work in lockstep with an empowered, unified ASEAN. Today, we take another critical step, beginning a new era in our cooperation with the launch of the U.S. ASEAN Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Together, we will tackle the biggest issues of our time, from climate to health security, defend against the significant threats of rule-based order, to rule-based order, and, the, and to threats to the rule of law, and to build an Indo-Pacific that's free and open, stable and prosperous, resilient and secure. And we're putting real resources behind our approach, not just rhetoric. Over the last year, my administration has announced more than $250 million in new initiatives with ASEAN. And for 2023, I've requested $850 million in assistance for Southeast Asia. We're continuing to build on that progress, following through on our commitments, and launching concrete new initiatives that further strengthen ASEAN and increase, increase connectivity across Southeast Asia. Though uh, through our new U.S. ASEAN electric vehicle infrastructure initiative, we're going to work together to develop an integrated electric vehicle ecosystem in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, enabling the region to pursue clean energy economic development and ambitious emissions reduction targets. Similarly, we're launching a U.S. ASEAN platform for infrastructure and connectivity to bring the benefits of the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment to the ASEAN countries. 
Through this platform, we'll develop projects together based on the needs you identify to create sustainable, high standard infrastructure that supports the people of the region. We will build better future, the better future we all say we want to see and we're going to see for all but all one billion people in our countries. We'll also discuss Russia's brutal war against Ukraine and our efforts to address the war's global impacts, including in Southeast Asia. So I look forward, I look forward to continuing our work together with the ASEAN and with each one of you to deepen peace and prosperity throughout the region, to resolve challenges from the South China Sea to Myanmar, and to find innovative new solutions to shared challenges. Thank you again for the 45 years of partnership between ASEAN and the United States and for all that we can accomplish together. Thank you. It's wonderful that uh, we gather with all, all of you again. This is my third U.S. ASEAN summit in my presidency. And I was honored to host the White House, at the White House in May. And now uh, that we are back together here in Cambodia, I look forward to building uh, even stronger progress than we've already made. And I want to thank the Prime Minister of, for Colombia's leadership and the ASEAN, as ASEAN chair and for hosting all of us. And, and also, I want to recognize that, that we're going to be in, uh, in the, all the work that Indonesia has done this year, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Um, and as the, uh, uh, the country coordinator, uh, coordinator for the United States. And uh, in fact, uh, this is, uh, as I said, my third trip, uh, my, uh, my third summit, second in person. And it's testament to the importance the United States places in our relationship with ASEAN and our commitment to ASEAN centrality. ASEAN is the heart of my administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, and we continue to strengthen our commitment to work in lockstep with an empowered, unified ASEAN. Today, we take another critical step, beginning a new era in our cooperation with the launch of the U.S. ASEAN Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Together, we will tackle the biggest issues of our time, from climate to health security, defend against the significant threats of rule-based order, to rule-based order, and, the, and to the threats to the rule of law, and to build an Indo-Pacific that's free and open, stable and prosperous, resilient and secure. And we're putting real resources behind our approach, not just rhetoric. Over the last year, my administration has announced more than $250 million in new initiatives with ASEAN. And for 2023, I've requested $850 million in assistance for Southeast Asia. We're continuing to build on that progress, following through on our commitments, and launching concrete new initiatives that further strengthen ASEAN and increase, increase connectivity across Southeast Asia. Though uh, through our new U.S. ASEAN electric vehicle infrastructure initiative, we're going to work together to develop an integrated electric vehicle ecosystem in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, enabling the region to pursue clean energy economic development and ambitious emissions reductions targets. Similarly, we're launching a U.S. ASEAN platform for infrastructure and connectivity to bring the benefits of the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment to the ASEAN countries. Through this platform, we'll develop projects together based on the needs you identify to create sustainable, high-standard infrastructure that supports the people of the region. We will build better future the better future we all say we want to see and we're going to see for all but all one billion people in our countries. We'll also discuss Russia's brutal war against Ukraine and our efforts to address the war's global impacts, including in Southeast Asia. 
So I look forward, I look forward to continuing our work together with the ASEAN and with each one of you to deepen peace and prosperity throughout the region, to resolve challenges from the South China Sea to Myanmar, and to find innovative new solutions to shared challenges. Thank you again for the 45 years of partnership between ASEAN and the United States and for all that we can accomplish together. Thank you. Stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app. Tonight, the bombshell testimony, Alec Murdoch taking the stand at his double murder trial. The South Carolina attorney denying he killed his wife and son, but then stunning the courtroom, admitting he lied to police about his alibi that night. The paranoid thoughts he said he was having in the moment Murdoch broke down as he described finding the bodies. Then the prosecution's turn, the tough questions he faced under cross-examination. Also tonight, the deadly winter storm on the move. More than a million customers without power in the Midwest, a down power line killing a firefighter, a parking garage collapsing under snow, the new threat in the West, rare blizzard warnings in Southern California. Al Roker is here. New clues in the toxic train derailment in Ohio. The NTSB saying it was 100 percent preventable. The preliminary report finding an alarm went off just before the wreck. What investigators say about the crew's actions and the potential cause. The shooting spree in Florida. A TV reporter and a nine-year-old girl killed. New body cam of police arresting the suspect. The new details. And the Emmy-winning star of Abbott Elementary, Cheryl Lee Ralph, on the obstacles she's overcome and inspiring a new generation. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. For the defense, accused murderer Alec Murdoch taking the witness stand today in South Carolina. Dramatic and at times tearful testimony from the man at the center of the country's most closely followed criminal trial. Murdoch under questioning from his lawyer saying, I didn't shoot my wife or son. And addressing what has appeared to be some of the prosecution's strongest evidence. Murdoch from the witness box admitting he lied about his whereabouts the night his wife and 22-year-old son were shot to death. Shocking up the lies through an opioid addiction and paranoia. Under cross-examination, Murdoch, a former lawyer, also admitted to stealing from clients. The prosecution has maintained the murders were part of Murdoch's attempt to escape accountability for financial misdeeds. We begin tonight with Katie Beck reporting from Walterboro, South Carolina. After nearly five weeks of testimony, a stunning surprise. I am going to testify. I want to testify. The trial's most anticipated witness takes the stand. Alec Murdoch testifies in his own defense. The first questions aimed at the heart of the case. Did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out on June 7th or any day or any time? No, I did not. Did you take a 300 blackout such as this and fire it into your wife Maggie's leg, torso, or any part of her body? No. I did not. Quick to confront what is perhaps the prosecution's strongest evidence, the video taken by Paul Murdoch at the dog kennels, placing Alec at the crime scene minutes before the murders. He's told investigators he wasn't there, but admits now he was lying. Alec, why did you lie? As my addiction evolved over time, I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid. Murdoch says he didn't trust state law enforcers and regrets the lie that led to many others. Did you continue lying after that night, did you not? Well, once I lied, I continued to lie, yes, sir. 
Emotional and crying throughout, Murdoch's testimony largely rewrites his timeline on the night of the murders, showering and changing clothes before dinner, and describing the moment he discovered the bodies, again saying he checked for signs of life. I know I tried to turn him over. When you say you tried to turn him over, what, why were you trying to turn him over? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I tried to. I tried to turn him over. Me and my boys laid face down. Later in testimony, Alec admits a longtime addiction to opioids, that he stole client funds, but denies being overly concerned about getting caught prior to the murders. What kind of uh, cases did you normally do? On cross-examination, prosecutors began by pressing Murdoch on the fraud cases, where he admits he stole money from his clients and lied to them. And prosecutors suggesting all the stolen money wasn't going to fund his pill addiction. You were generating millions of dollars in fees. That was not enough for you. Would you concede that? If, if by concede that, you mean was I also stealing money that I shouldn't have? Yes, sir, I agree with that. I've said that repeatedly. Katie, what do we know about how the jury was taking all this in, how they may have reacted? Well, Lester, the jury was captivated, so attentive to Alec Murdoch's testimony on the stand today. At times, Murdoch was repositioning his body to face the jurors directly and answer the questions directly to them. At one point, when Murdoch got extremely emotional, one juror that was sitting close to him actually slid a Kleenex box in his direction. Lester? All right, Katie Beck, thank you. Let me bring in our senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett. Now, Laura, what was the defense strategy here, and how does it appear to be playing out? Lester, this is the defense team going on offense. Clearly, the goal was to try to take the sting out of the damning evidence that the prosecution would raise on cross-examination, and that's likely why he was forced to admit that he lied to police and to his family all while trying to plant seeds of reasonable doubt. But testifying at all, it's a risky gamble. Already, the prosecution has tried to highlight his inconsistencies and also pierce through his folksy demeanor on cross-examination to try to show this jury that he's an accomplished lawyer who knows how to cover his tracks. Lester? All right, Laura, thank you. Now to that deadly, crippling winter storm that is stretching right now across the country. And a separate threat here in the West, Gabe Gutierrez is watching it all from Minneapolis. Tonight, devastating snow, ice and wind, pummeling even more of the country. This time, knocking out power to nearly a million people across the Midwest. Most of those outages in Michigan, where a volunteer firefighter was killed when a tree brought down a high voltage line. Volunteer just time here for free, gave his life for free. In Wisconsin, authorities say snow likely caused the partial collapse of a parking garage at a shopping mall. Today, Minneapolis under a snow emergency. Over the last few hours, we've seen a very rapid snowfall here. The road conditions are getting worse. Snow totals not as high as predicted earlier in the week, still around a foot, blanketed the Twin Cities over three days. This is a big one for all, to, all coming down at once. Like, yeah, this is a pretty big one. Coast to coast, treacherous road conditions. Portland, Oregon, recording its second snowiest day on record with more than 10 inches. This 20-car pileup in Southern California injuring at least eight people. A separate system now prompting the first blizzard warning since 1989 for the mountains near L.A. The Nationwide weather whiplash is remarkable even for February. Across the mid-Atlantic and southeastern U.S., record heat. Unusually high temperatures as far north as Philadelphia. Having a 70-degree day is just such a welcome break. But air travel is still dicey. More than 2,000 U.S. flights canceled just today, Lester. All right, Gabe, thank you. And that takes us to Al Roker. Al, as one storm moves out, another is moving in, impacting the West Coast. Lester, we have six million folks out west looking at winter weather advisories, winter storm warnings, blizzard warnings, including the San Bernardino Mountains. First blizzard warning ever issued there. Record lows likely. Uh, we're looking at morning lows in Reno in the 20s, Vegas into the 30s, even Los Angeles into the upper 30s, Salt Lake City in the 20s. We're looking at five to eight feet of snow back through the Sierra, but also the San Bernardino Mountains and the Santa Barbara Mountains as well. We're also looking upwards of 10 inches of 
of rain through Southern California. Significant roadway flooding and airport delays likely. Lester. All right, Al Roker, thank you. And new tonight, a preliminary finding about the cause of that toxic train disaster in Ohio as the Transportation Secretary visited for the first time. Ron Allen is there. Tonight, with the scene being cleaned up, new details about what caused the fiery derailment. Federal investigators saying a preliminary investigation shows an overheated wheel bearing likely to blame. This was 100 percent preventable. The NTSB says the train passed over two detectors, which showed the bearing was heating up. By the time it hit a third detector, it was 253 degrees above air temperature, triggering an audible alarm to warn the crew, who then slowed and stopped the train. This is a community that is suffering. This is not about politics. What I care about is figuring out how this happened. The NTSB chair says there's no evidence the crew did anything wrong. In a statement, Norfolk Southern says our highest priority is the safety of our people and the communities we serve, adding it will continue to support the NTSB's investigation. While today, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg visited for the first time after criticism from some residents that he should have come sooner, demanding the nation's rail operators stop resisting safety measures to cut costs. Let's get people from both sides of the aisle to the table and come to agreement on some steps that, that are needed, even if uh, the rail industry is pushing back. Meanwhile, near the crash, the Figleys only come back to their small farm to check on things like their chickens. They're part of a class action lawsuit that attorneys say includes over 500 residents. I live out of my car and at my daughter's house. It's awful. I feel homeless. Why won't you come back home? Because I, I, I don't know what I'm coming home to, and I'm 70 years old. Ron Allen, NBC News, East Palestine, Ohio. Now to Florida, where a series of shootings left three people dead, including a young girl and a reporter. Two more are hospitalized. A suspect is under arrest. Guad Venegas is there for us. Get on your face. Tonight, the Orange County Sheriff releasing body cam footage of the arrest of Keith Moses, the 19-year-old suspect accused of a deadly shooting spree in Orlando. Three victims killed, including a news reporter and a nine-year-old girl, two others critically wounded. Three multiple gunshot wound calls in the Hollywood Street area. The first killing happening Wednesday morning, where authorities found 38-year-old Natasha Augustine dead from a gunshot wound. Officials say the victim was an acquaintance of the suspect. Hours later, a news crew covering that incident was ambushed in their car, deputies say. The gunfire killing 24-year-old Spectrum News 13 reporter Dylan Lyons and critically wounding cameraman Jesse Walton. Jesse Walton. I just happened to catch a bullet, but he kept shooting at me, so I ducked behind the wheel of my car, and he walked forward and shot into my car uh, and ended up striking my reporter. Authorities say the suspect then fled the scene and entered a nearby home. I got two more cases, nine-year-old female. Deputies say he then opened fire again, killing a nine-year-old girl and critically injuring her mother. The suspect was arrested a short time later. We recovered a Glock 40 a semi-automatic handgun from inside of his pants. That gun was still hot to the touch, meaning it had just been fired. Moses is now charged with first-degree murder. And tonight, officials are still investigating a motive, but they say the 19-year-old suspect had a lengthy criminal history, including eight felony and 11 misdemeanor arrests. Lester? Guad Venegas, thank you. In 60 seconds, the battle over abortion, how an imminent court ruling about a widely used abortion drug could have an impact nationwide. It could be the most consequential abortion decision since Roe v. Wade was overturned. A Texas judge will soon decide whether to block access to a commonly used abortion pill nationwide. Dasha Burns reports. Amarillo, Texas, now at the center of America's abortion debate. Here, a group of anti-abortion doctors and medical organizations are suing the FDA, challenging the approval of Mifeprex, generically known as Mifepristone, part of a two-drug regimen commonly used for abortions that's been approved by the FDA since 2000. 
Alliance Defending Freedom arguing the FDA didn't adequately evaluate the drug's safety. We're asking the court to do what is right to follow and ask the FDA to follow the law by taking these dangerous drugs off the marketplace. Committee Presiding over the, the case, a conservative to, judge appointed uh, by former President Trump. An injunction would cut off access to mifeprestone nationwide. If the plaintiffs win this lawsuit, what will be the effect? It will be devastating. Even in places where they've worked very hard to secure access to abortion, states like California, New York, uh, here in D.C. Abortion providers like Dr. Serena Floyd say the lawsuit is based on misinformation. How dangerous is this medication? Uh, it's not dangerous at all. The evidence is solid. The science is solid. The complication rate is less than 1%. The FDA told NBC News it does not comment on ongoing litigation. But in a court filing said the claims in the lawsuit are, quote, unsupported by any evidence. Since 2000, more than 5 million women have taken mifeprestone, with 28 deaths associated with the drug reported. Millions of women have taken these drugs safely. Doesn't that paint a contrary picture to your complaint? I'm seeing these women in my own practice. Uh, my emergency room physicians, they're telling me how frequently they're seeing these complications, that women come in with retained tissue, with heavy bleeding, with serious life-threatening infections. In a court brief, the country's leading group of OBGYNs say mifeprestone is, quote, exceedingly safe and effective, calling the lawsuit, quote, ideological, not scientific. The result, if you win, is that abortion access will be significantly limited. Is that the goal of this lawsuit? No, the goal of this lawsuit is to protect American women and girls from dangerous chemical abortion drugs. There is another drug, mesoprostol, that can be used for medication abortions, but doctors say it can be less effective on its own. Back in Amarillo, Amanda Barnes traveled from Atlanta to protest this case. It's ridiculous that just because, you know, we were born with a uterus and certain body parts, that we should have to be subjected to this treatment. The next frontier in America's abortion battle. Dasha Burns, NBC News, Amarillo, Texas. Coming up, our exclusive report on the flow of goods into Russia despite sanctions. As the war in Ukraine approaches the one-year mark, the U.S. is pushing for more sanctions against Russia. But are the ones already in place having an impact? Keir Simmons went inside neighboring Georgia to find out how Russia is getting around them. If you want to know how the Russian economy is surviving amid punishing Western sanctions, you might come here. We're just across the border in Georgia, and it's lined with trucks. President Putin.